If you watch an F1 driver steering into a fast corner, you'll notice something strange. Just before they turn into the corner, they actually turn away from it. Take a look at somewhere like Cops at Silverstone, a really fast right-hander. The driver will make a tiny steering input to the left, then immediately turn right into the corner. And it's not just one corner or one driver. You'll see this in fast corners all over the calendar. It's a technique that pretty much every F1 driver uses. So why would you steer away from a corner before you turn into it? It does seem completely backwards. You're effectively making the lap longer and you're pointing the car in the wrong direction, even if it's just for a fraction of a second. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a while, you'll know that I used to be a driver coach. That's actually why I started Driver61 in the first place. And over the years, I've worked with hundreds of racing drivers, helping them get faster. And I've also driven more than 30 F1 cars myself, which means I've felt what this technique does to the car at different speeds with different setups. And I know how important it is. So what's actually happening? Well, there are two parts of this. First, you're making the corner wider. You're using more track on the outside. And second, you're preloading the suspension and tires gradually rather than hitting them with all the forces at once, which in turn gives you more grip. And both of these things matter for going through a corner as quickly as possible. And they actually have other benefits as well. To understand why, we need to look at the physics, starting with why a wider corner radius makes you faster in the first place. And this part is simple geometry. If you decrease the radius of a corner, make it tighter, you have to decrease your speed. That's just physics. The tighter the corner, the more lateral force you need to get around it. And the tires only have so much grip available, which can be used for braking, turning or accelerating, or a blend of changing speed and direction. So by turning out slightly before you turn in, you're using more of the track. You're making the corner radius bigger, less tight. Now you might think that adding distance to the lap by going wider makes the driver slower. And yes, the distance is slightly longer, but the speed you can carry through the corner more than makes up for it. You're trading a tiny bit of extra distance for a much higher minimum corner speed. Of course, it's the same reason why racing drivers use the full width of the track. Enter on the outside, clip the apex on the inside, then back to the outside on exit you're maximizing the radius, minimizing the lateral force required. So that's the geometric side of it. But the second part, the preloading of the suspension and tires is where it gets more interesting because this is about managing how quickly those forces build up. First, let me show you exactly what happens with the steering wheel when you use this technique compared to just turning in hard from a straight line. Let's say you need about 10 degrees of steering angle to get through a corner. If you turn in hard from straight, you're spiking from zero to 10 degrees in one quick motion. That's a really aggressive rate of change. And if you turn in at the same point, but try and turn in more gradually, you'll miss the apex of the corner. But if you turn out first, you'll go a few degrees away from the corner, unwind back through zero, then progressively build up to 10 degrees. Because you're initially turning away from the corner, you can begin to turn into the corner a bit earlier. It's the same total angle, but it's spread over much more time with a lower rate of change. And that really matters because when you spike the steering from straight to hard turn in, you're creating a sudden load transfer spike that the suspension and tires have to deal with all at once. But when you spread it out, you're giving the car time to respond. The load transfer builds up gradually instead of spiking. Now, to understand why that's important, we need to look at how tires actually produce grip. When you turn into a corner, weight shifts from the inside wheels to the outside wheels. That's called load transfer, which you can feel in your road car as you go round a corner. But what's relevant here is that the tires don't produce grip in a linear way. If you double the vertical load on a tire, how much it pushes down into the track, you don't get double the grip you actually get less than double. So imagine you've got 1,000 arbitrary units of load on a tire. It might give you a coefficient of friction of 1.8. So multiply that up and you get 1,800 units of grip. But if you put 2,000 units of load on the same tire, the coefficient drops to something, for example, like 1.65. So you get 3,300 units of grip not 3,600. And if you load the tire up with 3,000 units, the coefficient drops even more to let's say 1.5. So you're only getting 4,500 units of grip. Now let's apply this to a corner. But before we get into that, I need to tell you about today's sponsor, Brilliant. 
When you're working in a world built on physics, data, and engineering, it helps to actually understand how all that stuff works. And that's where Brilliant comes in. Brilliant is a learning app built around interactive problem solving in maths, physics, programming, data analysis, and more. It's designed to help you build real understanding through hands-on lessons, not passive watching. You're working through challenges step by step, which is a method proven to be six times more effective than just watching videos. Whether you're brushing up on fundamentals or diving into advanced topics like circuits, algorithms, or scientific thinking, Brilliant makes it easy to learn a little every day and actually enjoy it. You can try everything Brilliant offers completely free at brilliant.org forward slash driver61. And if you like it, you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant, and now back to the video. So you've got a total of 4,000 units of load that needs to be distributed between two tires on the same axle. When you corner the weight shifts to the outside, you can't avoid load transfer, but you can control how extreme it is. With harsh, sudden steering inputs, you shock the suspension and create extreme load transfer. For example, the outside tyre might get 3,000 units of load, while the inside tyre only has 1,000 units. That's your 4,000 total, but very unevenly split. Now, 3,000 units of load with a coefficient of 1.5 gives you 4,500 units of grip, and the 1,000 units of load with a coefficient of 1.8 gives you 1,800 units of grip. So the total available is 6,300 units of grip. But with smooth, progressive inputs, you manage the load transfer more gently and get a higher coefficient of friction. Now the outside tire has 2,500 units of load and the inside tire has 1,500. It's still 4,000 units total, but more evenly split. So 2,500 units of load with a coefficient of 1.6 gives you 4,000 units of grip. And 1,500 units of load with a coefficient of 1.7 gives you 2,550 units of grip. So that makes the total 6,550 units of grip. That's about 4% more grip just by managing how quickly and harshly the load transfers. But there's another element here that matters. When the car turns, the suspension has to roll over. The body leans to the outside, compressing the outside suspension and extending the inside. Depending on the car, the suspension needs somewhere between 50 and 100 milliseconds to fully settle and stabilize the vertical load on the tires. At 250 kilometers per hour, that's only about three to seven meters of track. And if you're asking for the grip from the tires before the suspension has finished settling, you're asking them to work before they're properly loaded. Now, modern Formula 1 cars make this time window even more important. As we know, they run really stiff suspension because they need to keep the car's ride height as consistent as possible for the aerodynamics. The floor has to be a specific distance from the ground to generate the maximum downforce, and this window is tiny, so therefore it has to have stiff suspension. But the car will still roll over, just not all that much. And it happens almost instantly, rather than progressively if the springing and roll bars were softer. And this is where a driver's feel is really important. I used to call this part of the turn-in phase the introduction. You're introducing the car into the corner. You're preparing it for the maximum lateral load. And the timing and harshness of the turn-in is really important. If you don't manage it properly, the car will feel unsettled. The suspension is still moving, still trying to stabilize, and you're already asking it to corner hard. And that's when you can get mistakes from a driver understeer, snap oversteer, or just an inconsistent entry. At best, the driver just won't feel confident. So the suspension needs some time to settle, but the tires themselves also need time. Interestingly, a lot, perhaps most, of the ride height change at the front of an F1 car comes from the tire squashing. So here's what happens. When you start to turn the steering wheel, the tire needs to deform before it can generate the maximum lateral force the most turning. The contact patch of the tire, the bit where the rubber is actually touching the road, has to expand. The sidewall has to deflect, and that deformation actually creates more grip. As the tire deforms, it creates what's called slip angle, the difference between where the wheel is pointing and where the tire is actually traveling. And the tire also acts like a spring. The more it deflects, the more force it generates pushing back against the road. 
Now, racing tyres generate maximum grip at a specific slip angle, and it's somewhere around three to four degrees from modern F1 tyres. Now, if you turn in gradually, turning out then progressively turning in, the contact patch has time to expand uniformly, and the slip angle builds up smoothly to that three to four degree sweet spot. The tyre is structurally ready to handle the load, and the driver will get maximum grip. But if you snap the steering wheel in suddenly, the contact patch can't expand fast enough. The load concentrates in just one part of the contact patch, usually the center or the shoulders. And those localized spots exceed their grip limit before the rest of the tire is even working. You get micro sliding, the tire skips past the optimal slip angle and you end up with less grip overall. And if you get it right, there's a temperature benefit here too, which has been talked about a lot in 2025. When you spike the load suddenly, you create thermal spikes, localized hot points in the contact patch where the rubber is working too hard. And that degrades the compound, accelerates wear, and makes the tire less consistent over a stint. But if you load the tire progressively, the heat spreads evenly across the contact patch. The rubber is more likely to stay in its optimal temperature window, you get better tire life and the performance stays consistent for longer. Now, there's a few common mistakes with this technique. The biggest one is timing. If you turn in too early, you'll compromise your ideal racing line. And if you do it too late, you've missed the window. You're already at the turning point, so you don't get the benefit of spreading the input over time. When you get it right, the car feels planted. And because you've approached the limit of grip smoothly, the car is easier to drive. You're leaning into the limit of grip rather than smashing through it. And the driver gets more feel. This means that the tires load up smoothly, the car handles predictably, and you can get on the throttle earlier because you know the grip is there. Now, different drivers will use this technique in different ways. Some more pronounced, some more subtle, but the core concept is the same. You're managing the rate of load transfer to maximize grip. And this isn't just an F1 thing. You see it across all racing series. In fact, it's even more important in cars that have softer suspension. For example, GT cars and historic race cars, because they have more suspension travel and you need to give the suspension more time to settle before you demand grip. So that's why F1 drivers turn away from the corner before they turn in. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please watch this one just here and I'll see you next time.